I like Yay. I wore a fun shirt for you. Yay. <laughs> I love it. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Chai Together. Today is a Friday, and I am here with Miss Daylin. Daylin, pronounce your last name for me. Heretner. Heretner. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So on this platform, we use Chai, Courage, Hope, and Imagination to showcase the stories of hope and understanding and things that we can resonate with. So I want to dig into your story for a bit while you're here with us. So where would you like to begin? I don't know. Where, where, <laughs> there's so much, right? Well, I, I, I want to say thank you because I've been looking forward to this and I admire what you do highlighting all these stories. And I think it's so important for everyone to just listen to each other and realize that everyone has a story to tell and we can learn from everyone. So I appreciate you having me on your platform. And I really just admire admire this, this project that you're doing with Chai together. I have my cup, I left it at home, but I have my okay. cup right here. <laughs> I'll and show it for you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, um, thank you for that. Yeah, since I met you last year in Power Voice, I know you shared the story about your son and I've yes. worked with children with disabilities and my background is in teaching. So it really caught my heart, you know, because, you know, in Les Brown's program, there's so many stories that are so um, heartwarming and like really intense, a lot of trauma yeah. and a lot of single mothers, <laughs> like divorces is like really deep. Yeah. And yeah, so I've been watching your channel and I know you're bilingual, so you've been doing both English and, uh, is it Spanish, right? right. <laughs> Content, I want to make sure you just never know. That's what they say. Right? <laughs> and one thing you mentioned was, I remember one time you told me that, you know, supporting, uh, like, you know, commenting and liking your Spanish content, even though I don't understand what you're saying, but the fact that I know you're getting a message across. So I feel like that is universal in itself that you don't have to understand when you know someone's standing up for something. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Like, do you agree that just to I support, agree. even if you don't understand, you know? <laughs> I agree. And you know what? It, it sometimes... Them. It's got to do with who you know the person is, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and I know that we have become familiar with each other's content through the power of voice and beyond now following each other on social media that you just know that whatever that person is posting stands up for a specific mm -hmm. reason and you back them up because, you know, and I do I do believe that sometimes I do the same with some friends that I don't understand their content because they're in a different language, but I know what they, they stand for and I will support their voice. Um, you know, even if I may not agree with a hundred percent what they're saying at any given point in time, I support them voicing themselves and expressing their opinion because I know who they are and what they stand for. So yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I want to say the quality of your videos is amazing. And so like, tell us a bit of the projects you've been doing at YouTube and everything like that. And I know recently you've been speaking a lot about Cuba. So tell us about that too. So when you met me on the Power Voice, we met each other and you were one of the power speakers. Your, your story is impactful and amazing as well. And, you know, I was, um, of course, Les Brown, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Les Brown, what we can't say enough about him. Um, so I went into the Power Voice because I wanted to expand the way that I spoke about my son because in my it's my feeling that having a son that's autistic and you know severely disabled and nonverbal, it's my job as a mom to fulfill a mission that he has as well. So I am a firm believer that anyone, everyone that comes to this earth has a mission. And if they're unable to fulfill it on their own, it's on those people that are the caregivers, the caretakers to actually take that mission forward and voice their voice to the world. Um, there, we can learn any a whole bunch of stuff from everybody. And that's what prompted me to go into the power voice. So that hasn't stopped that's still you know a priority in my life but since i am cuban the cuban situation has gotten so bad within the last year that what i if one of the things that i gathered from les brown is use your voice where it will make a difference and in something that you're passionate about and i'm passionate about a lot of things my son of course is something that i'm passionate about 
But right now I feel my voice makes the biggest difference in the Cuba topic because there's so mis and so much misinformation and so much people don't know about Cuba that I do feel the responsibility as a Cuban who was born there and lived there till I was eight years old and having family that lives there and having, you know, having been grown up in Miami, which a lot of people are Cuban and all my family um, is from Cuba. I feel responsible. I feel responsible. And I feel that my voice needs to add to the real information that needs to be given to people. The real information, the real lived experiences from Cubans on the island, what I lived as a little girl, what I lived as a teenager, you know, becoming a Cuban American. And so that's where that is right now. I feel that our voice needs to adapt to the things that are happening and the things that are affecting us at that moment. And so I have placed a lot of the content that I had planned on hold because of this, because I think it's an urgent human crisis. It's a humanitarian crisis. And I do feel privileged that I can voice myself. And when I think about those people in Cuba that don't have freedom of expression, it makes me even more passionate about speaking because every time that we get to do this right now, every time that I get to do a video, you know, even if it's on TikTok, even if it's with, you know, my good camera, it doesn't matter. I, like, I just feel so fortunate to be able to do it freely and not suffer any repercussions, you know, not, not having the police knock on my door because I'm saying something that they might not agree with. So I, I feel so fortunate to live in a country where we can have the freedom of expression that allows us to use our voices for the good. And so that's where that's where I am right now. Wow. So what is your goal with this? Is it just to voice yourself, right? Like to voice yourself during this time and when that period is over, what do, what are you going to get back to? Like what is I, your dream? I, I'm going to, my content has always been on helping ourselves look beyond whatever our difficulties are mm -hmm. because of this, you know, this period that I had in my life with my son, a whole bunch of um, situations that I had to go through that I know would help a lot of people. Uh, when we, when I talk about it, it has helped people in the past mm -hmm. to realize, Hey, you know, you don't, I don't have it that bad after all, you know, or I'm not the only one. So I want to make sure that I continue to do that. But even though I'm still doing somewhat different educational content on Cuba, et cetera, I do feel that people are still getting, you know, that inspiration because they do, they do see a mom that's got quite a few things that she's, you know, on her plate, a child with special needs, another one that's, you know, about to become 10 years old. I did the whole homeschooling pandemic thing. And on top of that, I did, I made time to make this content because I knew it would help people understand the situation better. So I think that beyond the actual content, people see the bigger picture and people see the desire to help. And that's what I'm here for. I wanna make sure that people look at my platform as a means of inspiration, you know, in general. And I know that somehow it's still happening and they can see through that um, with the content that I'm doing now. But yeah, for sure, I will get back to to more concentrated on my personal story and my overcoming and not only my personal story, but I'm trying to um, kind of do something like what you're doing, you know, where I interview people whose stories I admire, whose voices I think people need to hear because I need to hear them as well. And that's just it. I, I want to make sure it's an a source of inspiration, a place where you can come and, and, you know, realize that you're not alone, realize that everyone goes through struggles, but that we can overcome it. It's very possible. And if we just stick together, we can do it. Firstly, your voice is incredible. Do people tell you that? Like, like my you have a great voice. <laughs> yeah, like with like a little rasp, like your voice is great in itself. Thank so I saw you. recently. Yeah, I saw recently where um, you were on a panel, right? Yeah. For yeah. So was that the Cuban community came together where you live? This is an amazing place called Esquina de Abuela, um, um, Grandma's Corner. And it's a grandchild of a Cuban lady who she's, she fought for the revolution. 
um, you know, in Cuba. And then she realized that they weren't standing for what she fought for. And she was arrested. She became a dissident and she escaped to America. And he's got this place there that was his grandma's and he's dedicated to, he's made it a cultural center for the community. So he's got kids and, and he's got artists painting the walls, doing graffiti. He's got so much going on. Fabian is doing such an amazing job in that place. And he's got people like uh, the panel that we, that we were a part of on last Saturday is a group from the University of Miami. They're, they were doing like a social, it's called, a group called, I believe it's Protest Miami. I believe that's the name, if I'm not mistaken. And they reached out. Uh, because they saw my videos and they wanted to get a variety of people on the panel and like different Cubans on the panel. Mm -hmm. I was the oldest Cuban there, but <laughs> you know, these are all college kids and here I am like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm mom. But anyway, <laughs> that's besides the point. And, and yeah, and we talked about, uh, it was a um, community. It was just a community setting where people mm -hmm. were invited to listen to Cubans talk about their own experiences mm -hmm. with the um, with the goal of just having that intimate talk. You know, it's not on social. It's not on your phone. It's just that like family talk. There were couches, chairs. Mm -hmm. We were all just kind of sitting down and talking. And it was great because people asked questions and it was very civilized. I loved it. And I think we should have more of that, you know, where people just get together in a circle and talk and ask questions and say, well, how do you feel about this? I feel this. How about you? Like, do you agree? Do you disagree? Why? And we can have those discussions about topics that really often they get heated. Mm -hmm. But if we're respectful, yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> politics is a very, very, it's like a trigger topic. You know, you say politics and people are already like, yeah. You know, I want to say one thing on my form. It said, you know, is there anything you don't want to talk about? Most people wrote politics yeah. that they don't want to come on here and talk about politics. I know. <laughs> I know. And it, it makes perfect sense because it's a tricky subject. And it seems like this day and age, when you talk about politics, you have to be on one side and that's mm. it. And, and I'm realizing now that you just, you have to be very careful and be on the right side of anything, whether it be left, right, center, you have to be on the right side of the story. And we can't just marry an ideology or, or a, a side just because that's how we, you know, I'm always gonna vote Democrat or I'm always gonna vote Republican. Mm -hmm. And people think, I, people assume that I'm a Republican because I'm Cuban. So I'm automatically in the Republican, you know, <laughs> bin and I'm thrown there like, oh, Oh, you support Trump. People don't know the half of me, you know? So uh, I, and I'm not left or right. And that's also a problem with the Cubans. They're like, well, you need to define yourself. I am defined. <laughs> I'm completely <laughs> dictatorship. I'm pro-human rights, but I don't need to identify myself uh, just like that with anybody just because they are a certain party. Uh, so I, because if a party changes and somebody goes crazy, I'm not going to follow them on their crazy path, you know? We're rational thinking humans and we should be able to have these conversations. We should be able to have these conversations. So that panel was very refreshing because we talked about everything and everyone had different opinions, but it was very respectful. And in the end, it was so, so helpful for me and for the people there. So yeah, I ramble. I know I talk a lot. No, it's okay. <laughs> Well, Talking usually I listen. No, I do listen to what people say and then I respond, right? Not react. But I agree with what you said because, you know, you know, like you said, if, you know, Republican Party is going down a ditch, it's like you're going to not go with them. But it's like you can, you know, not like the person of whatever side they're on, but you can like their views or you can not like their views, but like the person. It's it's not I don't. I personally don't believe it's one sided. There's like pros and cons to each side, you know? Exactly. So I definitely agree with that. And it's like being open minded about that. So do you feel that you would ever like run for office or? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't think I'm cut out for it. I really wow. don't think, no, I don't think I'm cut. I think I. I think that would limit me. That would limit me because I believe like politics to me is such an uncomfortable game. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. It's such a, I mean, and I admire people who want to be good politicians, but to me, inevitably it ends up being using people for your gain, you know? That, that it boils on to that because you need votes. So you need to convince a certain amount of people, you know, to vote for you. And you have to just, that's what you have to do. And I think that by speaking on my own, I need to make sure that I speak to the people, not a certain side of people that are, I'm interested, you know, in, in getting their vote. No, I think that I need to speak to the people, the masses, and make sure that the people are, are, you know, involved in critical thinking and they have like the all the facts and, and give them different ways of seeing things. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we're so stuck, you know, on mainstream media and we don't realize that there are other angles to view a story. There are other sides to things that we may have not seen before. And when we get polarized, you know, by the message mainstream media sends, we as a people become separated. And when we divide the people, we easily fall like for anything. We really do need to be strong ass people. That's mm -hmm. what it is. And I don't think I would ever be able to run for office because of that. I couldn't be on one side or the other. I may change my mind tomorrow, but today <laughs> I don't think so. You know, I like that you said we all need to be strong ass people because um, a lot of people are not, you know, whether it be, you know, mentally, like physically, it all goes hand in hand. But if you don't take care of yourself, you know, you're not. I want to ask you, you know, I know your son, um, you say that he is severely disabled, right? And I saw how he was dancing. So like, how's he doing? Like, what are his improvements? And, you know, how do you cope, you know, working, right? Like a career, like full time, right? Yeah. And then now you even added on responsibility. And I wanted to mention, you know, Sadhguru, you know, Sadhguru, right? Yes. Yeah. So he had said responsibility is, you know, your ability to respond. Like, you know, it's it's your choosing to respond to that, you know, and taking on that responsibility, like doing what you can. So right. but yeah, I just want to know how you cope and, you know, how your son's doing. My son, when I say severely delayed, um, disabled, it's because he's yeah. developmentally delayed globally. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are kids that are more disabled than he is, you know, mm -hmm. that they, they have more severe uh, situations. But Alexander, he's just, uh, he started taking his first steps in 2019, Yay. which was so exciting. And he's still, you know, in the process of, of um, learning to walk. It's a very mm -hmm. slow process for him. He still doesn't have it down, but he's, you know, he works on it. And um, yes, he, he moves to music when he's, you know, if he's um, standing, he's holding on to something. He loves music. Alexander, uh, he's doing better, you know, mm -hmm. and I am so, I'm so um, grateful for the therapies, especially behavior therapy mm -hmm. that he's getting because it's helping him find avenues to communicate, you know, with little signs here and there. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing to see what the field does in therapy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a patience to be a therapist, not even to my own son. You know, right. everybody has a gift. Everybody has a talent and his therapist is a godsend. Like all the, all of them are, but one of them in particular comes to the home and helps Alexander with behavior. He's amazing. And Alexander loves him. That's like his best friend. So I think, you know, they click and that helps a lot. How do I cope? I see my son progress little by little. And mm -hmm. when I say little by little, it took him nine years to actually take the first step. So I mean, little by little, you know, you have to be very mm -hmm. patient. I've made peace with the fact that this is not an immediate anything. Everything takes time. I've learned that. And I have realized that in, in all in all, I'm a very lucky person to have been able to live an experience that has shaped me in a way that I didn't think was possible. And so I'm a believer in God and I know God has his plans and ways of doing things that I don't know. And I trust that it took me a long time to accept it, but I do trust it. And I know I now see where he was taking me. So with this whole situation about taking on this, these projects and, I want to make sure that people realize that just because you have a situation that is is difficult 
in your life, you shouldn't give up on anything, on other responsibilities that you find you need to be addressing. So yes, my son has a, a disability. That's not an excuse for me not to voice myself when I perfectly can. And I am proving that I can without, you know, being negligent without, sometimes I have to wake up really, really early in the morning to film a video when he's still sleeping. I do it when he's still asleep so I can get the time to do it, you know, without being interrupted. Or when he goes to bed at night, I prop on some, some lights and turn on the camera and there I go. And then when, you know, I sit him on my lap a lot of the time, you know, while I'm editing or he's there in his playpen while I'm editing. Wow. And and that's just, it, and I feel it needs to get done. So I do it, you know, do I have to make sacrifices? Yes, I do. Uh, sometimes I haven't gotten enough sleep during the night and I feel like I want to sleep for an extra two hours or until Alexander wakes up. But I choose to wake up earlier because I feel that this needs to get done. And so I just think that when you have the compromise with a mission and you have accepted that and you decide to move, decide, you decide to move forward, forward with it, uh, forward with it. <laughs> um, when you do that, you realize that with discipline, you, it's achievable. It's doable. Um, you know, I don't want to be the person that's laying down and, and saying, oh, it's really hard for me. Yeah, it is really hard for me. It's hard for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It's not just hard for me. I, I that would be really unfair to say, oh, this is so hard. Yeah, because you know, my son. Yeah, because you know, no, no. Ex I've learned that the more excuses you make, the weaker you become. Wow. <laughs> so I, I, I do, I do have to stop sometimes because you know, it's a lot. So there are things that I can't do. Like there are a lot of um, activist uh, events, especially now going on that I just can't attend because Alexander's sensitive to loud noises and stuff like that. But Hey, I could still be part of the process. I could still be part of the mission, you know, from my platform and I could still do uh, my part. We can't, we can all do our part from wherever we are. It doesn't have to be on social. It doesn't have to be on a camera. It could be, you know, in person. I'm surprised. Oh my gosh, how people, like the other day I went to film one of the, uh, uh, one of the, day, uh, the other day I went to film one of the murals being done on behalf of Cuba. And they're I saw that with your friend, right? Yes. And so we were looking at the mural and there was one guy there that I was going to film and he's like, oh no, 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 no. I'm afraid of the camera. I can't do the camera. But this guy was approaching people on the sidewalk, something I'm terrified of doing, like approaching people, just strangers on the street. And he was approaching them to come see the mural. And he was telling them the story about the mural. And I'm like, that's where you realize that everybody has a spot in this mission and any mission. I, I'm really, I'm really, you would think the opposite, but I'm really terrified of approaching strangers on the street and telling them, Hey, come look at this. I'm not that person. You know, my voice is, is here. And, you know, I'm way less intimidated by a camera than by people in person, but it's the opposite for people, you know, out there in the world. So everybody has their spot and no excuses. You can still be part of it. You can still for, fulfill your purpose wherever you are. You just have to set your mind to it and do it. That's what Les had said. That's why I started this. Yes. Yeah. From where you are with what you have. Exactly. You know, I don't have anything fancy. I still do it. Of course. <laughs> my first video was on my iPhone. I just recorded it and people asked, did you, did you get everything, you know, your mic, your all so I was like, no, like I was homeless. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Um, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. So, you know, with the energy you have and all this passion, you know, you have a great story. Like this is, we're just talking about like present, what's happening right now. We're mainly discussing about Cuba. Yeah. So just, um, you know, there may be people who don't know what's going on in Cuba. Do you want to just touch on that? Sure. Yeah. So Cuba has been under a dictatorship for 62 years mm -hmm. and, you know, things were not, things have been on and off in terms of what you call bad. So Cuba has gone through its stages and now, right now it's at a really bad stage. And so what happened is people are, they've had it. Um, 
like my family personally right now, they don't have medicine. My aunt has ulcers on her leg and she needs antibiotics and there's no, there, there's no medicine to be found anywhere. And so the pandemic has made it even worse because with the lack of resources, people are dying, dying by, you know, loads of people are dying and we can't really trust a dictatorship to give you the exact number. So they're always going to say, you know, the situation is under control. No, it's not, you know, uh, we know because we have family, we talk to our families, we know the reality in Cuba. And so the people have had it and they, they know the risks of going to the streets demanding freedom, demanding change, and they still did it. So on July 11th, they flocked to the streets to say, you know, we don't want any more communism, we want freedom. We're tired of being hungry, we're tired of being tired, we're tired of being surveilled and, um, and controlled. And the president, which I don't, that's a big word for him, a big description, but mm. um, the president went on national TV and he said the combat order is given and he sent his special forces and uh, law enforcement on civilians that were on the streets uh, manifesting peacefully. And so the civilians, of course, became aggressive once the police began to try to take their loved ones from them. Of course, they're going to react. They're not armed. They don't have arms in Cuba, um, but they had, you know, rocks and sticks and stones. That's all they had. So that's what they had to defend themselves with. And of course, then now the, the, um, the government is manipulating it, saying, well, these are delinquents. Well, you know, they have to be fun. They have to defend themselves. If I'm a mom and you're trying to take my 17 year old child from me, I am going to defend myself. Does that make me a delinquent? Well, in the Cuban government's eyes, yes. So we have a lot of people that have disappeared. We have a lot of people dead. Um, we have minors being taken from their homes uh, that are military service age. They were taken from their homes, uh, kidnapped basically, like taken, torn from their homes to be uh, forced them to force them to oppress other people because they were running short. And this is the way they have to control and continue to, you know, um, spread fear. That's been their tactic their whole life, the, our whole lives. And so right now what's happening is people are still flocking to the streets, but we're getting the videos with delay because the government cut off the internet on the whole island. So right now the internet is intermittent. And so we don't have the videos in real time. And people think, oh, everything's calmed down. No, everything has not calmed down. People are still going to the streets. People are still getting massacred on the streets. Um, they're still getting harassed. And they're demanding freedom, freedom. They, they, they're ready to die for it. And when you see people ready to die to be free, you know they've had it. So what's going on, just to give you a, a really quick, uh, you know, wrap it up with the Cuba situation, mainstream media in the U.S. has made it seem like they're upset because they don't have food and, and they need COVID vaccines. Mm. And, and so a lot of people are saying, well, you know, politicians have said um, it's due to the embargo in Cuba, you know, let's lift the embargo. The people don't want the people want freedom. An embargo, which was placed on Cuba because the Cuban government stole property from American businesses at the time before the revolution. They came in and, you know, uh, confiscated a whole bunch of stuff. They were sanctioned for that. But the embargo doesn't prevent the Cuban government from getting medicines, from getting food. In fact, all the chicken that is consumed in Cuba is, says, product of the USA. Mm. Cubans are very familiar with American brands. The embargo has nothing to do with that because if you look at Cuba, um, the tourism, hotels have food that Cubans don't have. Um, international clinics have, you know, all the things that tourists need to be treated. Yes. So apparently the resources are there. Um, they're just not being applied to the people because they don't give power to the people because that's how they keep them under control. If you mm -hmm. keep people in survival mode and oppressed, they don't really have the energy or the time to be thinking about rebelling until their last moment where they're like, this is it. This is all we got. We either die for something or die, you know, of COVID and nobody comes to see us. People are waiting three days in their homes with their dead family member because the ambulances are not showing up to, to pick people up dead or alive. And so when you see that they say, well, there's no fuel for the ambulances and you look at the videos and the streets are militarized with trucks and police. And you're like, well, where's the, there's fuel. These trucks, these 
they have fuel. It's just not being applied where it should be. And so this is not a political issue. This is a human rights issue. And that's what me, I as a Cuban want to make sure we leave clear. Mm. People want freedom. People really have had it. The, the Cuban government suddenly filled the stores with oil. They gave, they, um, they gave more rice and the rations. Like suddenly food is appearing because they want people to, you know, to calm down and be quiet. But people are even more angry because they're like, wait a minute. You were, I was making 12 hour lines to get rice before. And now because people protest, you give rice. Are you serious? So people are like, so you had the food sitting there doing what? Like on what reserve did you have a starving? And so people are really real. People in Cuba are realizing a lot of things now. And thank God for the internet. That's allowing the world to see what we've been knowing for a while. Thank God for the internet that's allowing Cubans to actually get some information because in Cuba, you only have the official channels. All the information Cubans get is filtered, you know, through the Cuban government. So the only information that they get from the outside world is a little internet that they can get. So um, I believe that we just need to be careful and mindful of the needs of the people and what they're requesting. And that's just what I'm trying to, you know, take across to everybody. We really do need to be thinking of this as a human rights crisis. And humans, they deserve the right to speak. They deserve the right to say, I want freedom without being jailed, without being oppressed, without being killed. So that's what they're fighting for. And I think that we should at least, if we're not going to help, at least be quiet about it, you know? <laughs> Uh, there's a saying, if you're not going to help, just don't say anything and yeah. let the people who are willing to fight, fight along and, mm -hmm. uh, and take, and, and they're willing to die for it. They have, and I'm proud of them for that. I'm saddened because it is a tough fight. The fight for freedom is not easy. There's bloodshed that is required and that's a reality we have to face, but I am proud. I am proud that they have taken a stand and, uh, to demand what is you know, they're rightful, they're, they're right, they're right to be able to be free, to be able to express themselves, to have a decent life of a human being. And that's it. That's, that's in synthesis what's going on. I find it to be fantastic how you articulate yourself <laughs> and Me like too. the research you've done. And I like the point that you make, you just want to bring more awareness and mindfulness to what is really the root issue, not the things that we're seeing, such as food and vaccine. That's what I heard of as well from a friend. And, you know, that's the surface level. But, you know, like you said, what they're asking, asking for is freedom. That's why, like, we're so blessed to be, you know, in the States. It's like, things happen, but there's always things happening worse somewhere else too. So, and people who live here don't understand, people may say they hate America for political reasons or whatever, but you don't understand that there's places overseas and third world countries that uh, is way worse, even medically, um, you know, financially, like education system. So yeah, I, I, I lived in Thailand for 10 months and I've seen poverty, you know, I've seen things that corruption and things that I'm sure you've seen too. And I also lived in India. So I've seen things since I was young and those things are not, you know, the proper mannerisms or like ways of, you know, how you go about things in the States. So I, I find it to be really a blessing that we're like safe here and mm -hmm. that we can voice ourselves in the safety of our homes, like you said, and that you're, you're not quieted, you know, exactly. just, exactly. I think it's incredible that, you know, me seeing you, just from the power voice program. And then you created your channel and took the step to do this. Was it just the calling you had, like you did it yourself or did, you know? Yeah. yeah. I've always, I've always been very outspoken just in, in, you know, not, not as much on social, mm -hmm. but I grew up in a church. My dad was a pastor and um, I was always speaking. That was my thing. I love to speak. <laughs> yeah. You can tell. <laughs> And um, I'd love to speak, I'd, I'd love to voice myself. And when I realized that the voice is a powerful mm -hmm. tool to actually reach people, then I realized it, it was more than just speaking for speaking, you know? 
Um, yeah. It's a way of actually getting into people's hearts and realizing that that's the way we connect. And that's the way that I have to connect. Other people have, you know, other people can sing with their beautiful voices. I can't sing. Yeah. But <laughs> Me either. I, wish, I wish that was my voice gift. Right. But, you know, I can speak, I guess. And that's that's what I'm going to do. And, and that's yeah. it. Yeah, I think it's great. You're an activist, whether you're able to make it to those events or not, you know, you're an activist at heart. And like you said, you're doing the videos, you're doing what you can, right? Waking yeah. up before time and all those things. And those are the little things that add up and that do matter because, you know, you starting this now, let's say even if it takes four, 10, 14 years, you know, you may get discovered and beyond who knows Oprah next or anywhere. You really don't know when people seek you out and where you can end up. But if you had never posted that video, it went viral or whatever, you wouldn't have been known, period. So it's like you took that action step to do it. It's all about action. Like you yes. talk about it. You could have the best mindset, but if you don't move, nothing moves, <laughs> you know? Yep. But I'm going to let you go now. I know you have to go, but I would love to talk to you again when we can. <laughs> me too. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. I love this. Yeah. I loved it. <laughs> I did. I loved it. So thank you so much. I, yeah. I appreciate Thanks you. Thanks for your time. No, no, no. Time. I've learned, I've learned like the value of time. You know what I mean? As I'm growing older, like I'm going to be going to grad school in January and I'm, I'm learning and it's for, actually for speech pathology. That's and amazing. I'm just learning that how important time is and the decisions we make as adults that really do impact the future. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Thank You're you, amazing. Daylin. <laughs> so are you. It's really refreshing. It's like I can see you like, you know, a movie on you. Like I can see... <laughs> You remind me, you know, Avita manifesting girl. <laughs> yeah, you know, Avita, like the movie Avita, right? Yeah, yes, of course. Like, I can see you being like, I'm all about women empowerment, and like, you know, you're someone that's like, you don't need a man to make you whole, like, you're a strong, independent woman, you know, who does all she can, and you have two children, right? Yeah, yeah, and you have two children, one, you know, with the disability, and it's like you hold it together just like the organization and discipline, like that's my word of the year. Like I need better discipline, but when you don't have a choice, I mean, if you know that it's going to crumble, if you don't have the discipline, then you have to have the discipline. Yes, you do. Yes, <laughs> so you do. I think it's amazing. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Day. You, <laughs> you drive safe. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.